Once again, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce someone that needs no introduction, certainly not in, in our community. Someone that with imagination, elegant and brilliant writing has made us laugh and has made us cry. But perhaps most important, someone that I think captures in his writing our common experience. In Waiting for Snow in Havana, the opening sentence is one that I still find as an extremely powerful sentence. And one that I think reflects how we all felt. The world changed while I slept. And much to my surprise, no one had consulted me. Please join in me in welcoming Professor Carlos Eire. Carlos. Thank you, um, and thank you all for being here. I think you could probably hear, just before I came down, I caught a cold, so bear with me. Well, this is the hardest job I've ever been assigned, because for the last eight years or so, I've given, I don't know, I lost count of how many hundreds of talks. But of course, these talks are always to people who don't know anything about Operation Pedro Pan. <laughs> So now, I have an audience that knows everything. What's there left to say? Well, it's kind of hard. But as we all know, um, the largest exodus of children in the history of the Americas, one of the largest in the history of the civilized world and human history, went largely unnoticed by everyone on Earth. Leave it to Cubans to do such a thing. <laughs> You know, exaggeration is, is one of our <laughs> chief character traits. Exagera. Uh, uh, yeah, you don't you don't you don't just feel a little bad when something terrible happens. You die. <laughs> and what you, everything is fatal. <laughs> so leave it to Cubans. You know, we we did uh, kind of outdo ourselves in in, in this uh, 52 year long so-called revolution, uh, which is one of the longest in, in the record of Latin American history and the world. And if you add to that the uh, six years before that of Batista, we had really outdid ourselves and continued to out outdo ourselves, which makes it very hard for the rest of the world to understand us because they think we're exaggerating, <laughs> when in fact we are not. Hardly anyone knows about Pedro Pan still, you know, except for Cubans. And every time I give a talk, I ask for a show of hands. You know, how many here in this audience who were alive in the early, mid-60s uh, even heard of this exodus? I get one or two hands, maybe, in an audience of around 100 people or so, 60 people, I get one hand. And it's usually someone who ran into a Pedro Pan uh, at some point in their lives, not someone who read about Pedro Pan in a newspaper at that time or heard about us in the news. The silence that surrounds our history is deafening. And since I'm a historian, for me, that's the most important thing, is to not just bring attention to our exodus, but try to bring attention to its meaning. And as, it's, as a historian, one of my greatest duties is to make sure that the past is uncovered correctly. And as you all know, and know all too well, we have our own internal history, each and every one of us in this room, the rest of the 14,000 of us who are still alive. We know what our history is, we know what we went through. But every one of us has run into a very different narrative at some point about the history of Operation Pedro Pan. 
This was brought to mind for the first time uh, for me. I was about 30 years old. I had just started teaching at the University of Virginia. And much to my surprise and delight, they had invited a famous Cuban writer to be in residence for a semester, Guillermo Cabrera Infante. And I had just finished reading his Tres Tristes Tigres and was just overjoyed to be able to sit in his seminar every week and hear him talk about his own writings. But uh, the first time I, I went to his house, he introduced me to his wife, uh, Uno de esos niños, one of those boys, and then proceeded to tell me stories about all the parents that he knew in Cuba who had sent their children to the U.S., especially the fathers, who did it uh, because the children were an inconvenience and they simply wanted more chance to play around. That's the first time I got, caught a glimpse of that other history, that counter history, that I've been struggling against for the rest of my adult life. For many years, I kept, uh, not necessarily a secret, but I kept it to myself, who I was and what my history was. Because every time I told someone, or every time, any time someone uh, learned that I was Cuban, <coughs> They'd tell me, they'd, they'd give me their take on how wonderful the Cuban Revolution had been. And it was too painful, so I had to keep burying it and burying it and burying it. Until Elian Gonzalez showed up, which was a turning point for me. Incredible. I went crazy. And um, I think if I had been a little saner, I might have sought professional help. But it's, it's a good thing I didn't. <laughs> but that boy uh, represented to me everything, everything about our history, this exaggeration in our history. I mean, can you get more dramatic or exaggerated than the case of Elian Gonzalez? You know, they find him floating in the ocean, they bring him here, he's got this family, and, and then all of a sudden the Cuban government starts saying, well, he needs to be with his father. Well, excuse me. The lights went on for me. Something is terribly wrong here, and what I'm seeing that's wrong here is what's been wrong the whole time, is that you know, the, 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 the public outside of our community doesn't know our history. And even worse, doesn't want to hear our history. I wrote to every major newspaper and magazine in the United States on my very fancy Yale stationery saying something very simple. Please put this story in its proper context. Write about the airlift that brought children to the U.S. And actually at that time, when I wrote that letter and sent it all over the place, I did not know that there were 14,000 of us. I thought maybe tops 3,000. When, when I finally picked up Yvonne Conde's book and found out the exact number, Oh man, I was, I fell off my chair. So anyway, I, I, I was trying to get the press to put the Elian case in context, not just because of the Pedro Pan exodus and the way in which many of our parents were left trapped in Cuba, but also later, the families have tried to leave together and the fathers who were sent to labor camps, sometimes for several years on purpose so they could quote unquote repay their debt to the revolution. And it was a long letter, about a page long. I didn't get a single acknowledgement. Not one publication acknowledged receiving my letter. So I went crazy. Um, the next thing I did, I thought they're not going to pay attention to me, no matter who I am or what my position is. So I decided to write uh, an essay. And I wrote an essay in which I and remember, this is the year 2000. Uh, I thought humor might be the way to get people's attention. So I wrote an essay in which I proved conclusively that Monica Lewinsky was an agent of Fidel Castro. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I don't have to tell you what the evidence is. I sent this story everywhere I thought they might uh, publish a humor piece and uh, didn't get anywhere with that either. <laughs> so I went really crazy. 
By that point, I had turned off my television, radio. I had stopped reading newspapers and magazines. I had cut off all communication with <coughs> news media and even told my dear old mother, no me digas nada sobre ese niño. No quiero saber. I didn't want to know how that would turn out. Of course, when it happened, she's the first thing she told me. <laughs> I wrote Waiting for Snow in Havana as a result of this trauma of seeing this boy. You know, well, sometimes we, we historians, we're very blind to the way in which we're driven to, to do history. And actually, it's very, very interesting to me that one of my specialties is the place of rituals and symbols in religion, and particularly in Catholicism and the way in which Protestants reject symbols. This boy was a symbol. He just opened up to me the depth of symbol and metaphor. He was me. He was every one of you. He was every Cuban still left in Cuba. And especially when I saw those images behind the newscasters' heads that have his picture, and here it is. And uh, CNN was the worst offender. They never mentioned his name and actually had the caption under the picture, Cuban boy. I began to tell the story in a way I wasn't supposed to because my, uh, my field as a historian is the late Middle Ages and the early modern period, so 1400 to 1700 in Europe, and particularly religious history, I had no business dealing with the Cuban Revolution. But I did, and I'm glad I did, because it opened up the story. People now know, people who pick up my books know about Operation Pedro Pan, simply by reading the books. And I snuck it in. I went to a Jesuit college, so I learned how to be sneaky. <laughs> yeah, I just sneak this stuff in. And, this, this is a book about a boy, boyhood, boyhood adventures, and so on. Oh, oh my God. And then, nine years later, after I wrote Waiting for Snow, which, by the way, in case you don't know, the original title, which I still think is the real title, would not be accepted by my publisher. It was Kiss the Lizard, Jesus. I couldn't understand why they didn't like that title. <laughs> so I said, how about Kiss the Lizard, Cuban Boy? I said, no, that still won't do. No. So I thought they were trying to Oprahize my title. And I suggested, in all seriousness, how about Kiss My Ass, Oprah? <laughs> and uh, for some reason, they didn't like that either. Waiting for Snow in Havana is one of 250 titles I came up with and submitted to them, and that's the one they liked. Stuck with that, which is okay. But nine years later, I find myself in Prague. And the strangest thing happened to me. There I am. I don't know if you've been to Prague. It's a beautiful city. It's one of the most beautiful cities I have ever seen. And what was the place my parents mentioned most often when they tried to explain why they were sending me to the U.S.? No queremos que te manden a Praga. Vamos a school, Berlin, and some other, they mentioned some other Eastern Bloc city, but Praga was up head on the list because that's where Fidelito had gone. And I think many of our parents had that image in mind, the image of Fidelito going to Praga foremost in my parents' mind. So there I am, and it's 20 years after they've gotten rid of communism. And the place is sparkling. And I'm thinking, what, what am I doing here? What's going on? My country is still under the old system. And then I stumble across a poster for the Museum of Communism in Prague. And I had a Kafka-esque moment, as most of you know, but Kafka lived in Prague. 
was a genuine Kafkaesque moment. Or I asked myself, if I go into this museum, am I a visitor or an exhibit? <laughs> because in a very real sense, I'm still an exhibit. All of us are. All of us should uh, travel together and flood the Museum of Communism in Prague and just stand there. <laughs> Let people look at us. And I asked my tour guide, have you been? She's about our age, you know, she's a woman in her 50s. And, uh, <laughs> maybe 40s, right? <laughs> I asked her, have you been to the Museum of Communism? She said, I don't need to, I lived it. <laughs> and she had that kind of voice too, so. So I wrote, learning to die in Miami follow-up, the immigrant experience. I never felt as much of an exile as I did in Prague those four days I was there. Suddenly I realized I'm an exile. What am I? Am I an American visiting here? Am I a Cuban visiting here? What am I doing here? This is where I might, where I might have ended up. And if I had stayed there, well, I would have lived through 20 more years of communism, but then it would have been over. Started thinking about the whole deal, so I'd had enough requests to write volume two, and I did. And I came up with um, the title, Learning to Die in Miami, because I already knew about the Oprahizing tendencies of my publishers. <laughs> and um, I, I, laugh, I laughed so hard when the book finally did come out. The very first group, professional group, to show great interest in the book was the American Association of Retired People. <laughs> because they thought it was about old people coming, coming to Florida to, to die. Yeah. And they even, they even gave me a spot on their Spanish language radio program. And speaking of Cuban exaggeration, I was trying to find a a translation for the title. Uh, what did I come up with? Miami y mis mil muertes. <laughs> we don't die just once, we die a thousand times. <coughs> but the title, in case you haven't picked up the book, has to do with something that all of us went through in a very intense way, which is that when we got on that plane, we died arrived here as new people. Very sudden. Uh, it's not just our childhood that died. It's our, our ties to our family. And we came here, we had to instantly become new people in very strange circumstances, you know, for, for children, even teenagers. I think now that I've had teenagers, even more so for teenagers, to, to have to be reborn without your parents there it's quite a challenge. So the theme of the book, the larger theme of the book, of course, remember my Jesuit like sneakiness, right? <laughs> it's an immigration story. It's an immigrant story, but it's more than that. It has a deeper level, it's a philosophical and theological level, which is the need all of us have to learn how to die gracefully several times in our lifetime. Because we all die several times in our lifetime. Our case is extreme. And of course, being Cubans, it had to be that way. <laughs> but everyone is in exile from childhood, no matter where they live or what their life history is. My wife, for instance, born and reared in Poughkeepsie, New York. Every time we went home to visit her parents, we slept in her bedroom. <laughs> in which she had grown up. And I always asked her, Jane, what's it like to be here in this room where you were a little girl? She says, what, are you nuts? She just couldn't understand. We're all exiles from childhood. In a special way, we Pedro Pants. Because unlike most people who can go back home and revisit physically the place where they grew up, most of us have been unable to do that. 
detox, there was a psychiatrist present. Not that she was seeking me out because she knew I needed help. <laughs> she was just there. And she said her specialty was childhood trauma and memory. And she told me something that I think is, 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 is true. Our deepest memories, memories of trauma, and actually our memories of trauma are stored in a different part of the brain from other memories. And the memories that affect us the most are memories of when we've been wronged, memories of injustice. Those shape us. They're not just memories, she said. They shape us. They make us who we are. The strangest talk I ever had to give, and maybe some of you were at this talk, uh, I was asked to speak to the Florida Psychoanalytic Association. Was anybody there? <laughs> well, imagine a room full of um, even more people than are here, uh, you know, Freudian analysts. And um, I'm giving a talk full of jokes and nobody's laughing. <laughs> God forbid. Um, <clears throat> even when I thanked them afterwards, you know, about 300 of them, I said, well, thank you for letting me speak to you. And not sending me a bill for 300 hours of therapy. <laughs> One of them in his talk told about very earliest childhood development. That was his specialty. He said, children, as they awaken after coming out of the womb, attach to people. Obvious, that's obvious. They attach to the people around them. But they also attach to the space around them. And for anyone up to the age of 10 or 11 or 12, you separate them from their physical surroundings. And that is as much of a trauma as separating them from their parents. That's what he claimed, and I think he's right. What he said is any child who's been moved by their parents you know, is an exile. But we're a unique case, you know, we're Cuban, we have to be unique, we have to exaggerate about everything, we've got everything combined in the Pedro Pan store. So, you know, looking forward, in this conference, we're going to hear about all the important aspects that we need to think about the Pedro Pan story. How it happened, why it happened, what the alternatives were that our parents faced, and then what we can do in the future. What could be our contribution so that we're not just sort of passive victims. And, and no Pedro Pan I have ever known has been a passive victim. We've all been very engaged with the world and always trying to make up in some way for what went wrong in our parents' lives and in our own. You know the history. I don't need to tell you the history of how we came to be here and what happened. But here's what we really need to do as a group, and it's already starting and it's very important. You know, I'm a historian. I am obsessed about having records left behind. Records are so important, and there's no record better than first-person accounts. Yes, everyone who writes a first-person account has a peculiar perspective, <laughs> and sometimes they lie because they don't want to make themselves look better. Uh, or sometimes they leave bad things out because they don't want people to know about the bad things. But there is nothing like a first-person account, testimony, <coughs> especially to something that is denied by others, or, or, or an event, the history of which gets twisted. It's very important to have that. At Yale, where I teach, we have a Holocaust archive. Thousands upon thousands of videotapes of Holocaust survivors. <coughs> Please, don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing Operation Pedro Pan to the Holocaust. You know, there's no comparing anything to that. But what I'm speaking of is the necessity to have records, eyewitness accounts for something that is denied 
where the history of which is twisted. And I think it's important, you know, even if you're not thinking of publishing anything or selling it to Hollywood, it's important that we all leave behind our history for others to read. And I think it's one of the things that, you know, our group can do is to be an archive for this and try to solicit as, as, as happening already. And most important and most immediate, I was very, very happy to, uh, to hear that we are now taking testimony from parents because they are quickly vanishing. It's very important to have their take on things. You know, this is the one history that still needs uh, to have a, a, a book out there. Uh, the history of the Pedro Pan parents and what they faced. But simply being eyewitnesses to what happened could be our best contribution. And once people know what happens, once they understand history, as many have said, and sometimes this is attributed to the Spanish philosopher George Santayana, uh, he who doesn't know history is doomed to repeat it. We have a duty to make sure uh, that something like what happened to us doesn't happen again. And I'm not saying uh, that our parents did anything wrong in sending us out. What I'm saying is we need to prevent situations such as the one that forced our parents to send us away. But um, being a public witness, being a private witness, whether you're public or private, that testimony is very, 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 very necessary. And as a historian, I can tell you, I have fallen on my knees many times, never when someone is looking, and thanked someone for leaving behind a first-person account. Even though I tell them as I'm on my knees, you know, I really can't trust you 100%. <laughs> I thank them anyway. Nothing brings the past alive better than a first-person account. And we're starting here already uh, to do this. So to wrap up, you know, where do we go? What do we do next? I'm in a, I'm in a tight spot, as the American expression has. In a really tight spot. Because my scholarly books take me 10 years to write. And uh, I'm going to be 61 next week, which means Ten years per book, oh, how many do I have? Uh, it gets a little scary. Waiting for snow and learning to die each took me three months to write without footnotes. So and what do I do next? And now I'm two people. I'm the early modern historian, and I'm also a professional Cuban slash Pedro Pan. Really serious historians are not supposed to write about themselves. But I think perhaps the best history I have written are my two memoirs, not my heavily footnoted books that have won me all the scholarly acclaim because they bear witness to what happened. They bear witness to the history of Pedro Pan. And more than that, we are perhaps the best proof available of the failure, the awful failure of the so-called Cuban Revolution. What would drive parents to send their kids away as we were sent away? And when you do the math, it's astounding. There are 14,000 of us. I don't know how many of you know this fact, but when the door slammed shut in October of 62, there were at least 80,000 other children waiting to leave with visa waivers. 80,000 is the estimate. We're already up to 94, okay? Add to that the thousands who left unaccompanied with tío y tía, o abuelo y abuela. Uh, add to that, we don't know the exact number, and we need to get to this number somehow the ones that went to Europe and South America by themselves. Uh, the Pedros Simpan, and we'll hear about that story too. We're talking about over 100,000 children whose parents were willing 
send them away. In an island that had a population of only six million. I failed math in high school, so you do the math. You know, it's a huge percentage. We are perhaps the most telling statistic, the failure of the Cuban Revolution. Simply as numbers, we're a very telling statistic. As people with stories to tell, imagine what we can do. Every time, and I'll close with this, every time I come to Miami, I run into someone who is my alter ego. I find a Cuban my age who stayed and is now here. And I hear their stories. And I see what would have become of my life if I had stayed. I think of my, my close friend back in Havana, whom I didn't run into here in Miami, but Paris of all places. Miguel Salus Figueroa, Miguelito. It was his math textbook from fifth grade that convinced me as a child why I needed to leave. My parents were not sending me to school. This is uh, fall of 1961. Right? <coughs> All the schools are government schools. Miguelito's parents are sending him to school. But I'm looking at his math textbook and I see the math problem. And I've memorized it. Before our glorious revolution, the scumbag landlord used to charge Jose Hernandez so much for rent. After the urban reform, now our great leader Fidel Castro uh, has uh, straightened things out and now Jose Hernandez only pays so much. What percentage reduction is there? And I thought, this is it. Forget it. Out of here. I need to go. Miguelito, and some of you may know of him, ended up spending eight years in prison. And he was a plantado, right? And simply for saying the wrong thing to the wrong person, he ended up spending eight years in prison. That's who we could all, all be in had we stayed. So I thank my parents, I thank God, and I thank you, uh, brothers and sisters, because we are family, even though most of us got scattered and never got to know each other as a family. We have a story to tell. And we have a calling. And our calling is to tell that story as often and as fully as we can. Thank you.